Uh, as I go through the presentation, once I get through all of the species, the last one will be the bullfrog, uh, then we will pause for questions. I also have a quiz for you to see how well you know your calls. Um, so uh, then we'll, we'll take some of your questions then. So uh, Friends of the Rouge, for those of you not familiar with us, we are a nonprofit organization that was started in 1986. And we have been working since then to restore, enhance, and protect the Rouge River watershed through stewardship, education, and collaboration. And we do this mainly through hands-on programs that keep, get people out there cleaning up the river, restoring the river, and monitoring the watershed. And by signing up to participate in the survey, you're joining a whole crew of citizen monitors. And people do this type of activity around the world. And uh, over the past few years, there's been a big rec uh, recognition by organizations, even like the, the EPA, that uh, citizens can collect data that's very meaningful and useful for helping to assess the health of our world. Um, whoops, that was my phone. Um, so anyway, you are you are uh, um, just taking part in this, uh, this activity uh, that is so helpful uh, and useful to to building our understanding of the natural world. Um, so this program is supported by the Herb Family Foundation, Bosch, Mercedes-Benz Financial Services, uh, WM, and the Michigan Association of Environmental Professionals, as well as donations and memberships from people who care about the watershed like you. And if you are not a member, uh, please, please join today. So we live in the midst of one of the greatest freshwater systems in the world. Uh, as many of you know, 20% of the world's fresh water is located in our very own Great Lakes. And of all the Great Lakes state, Michigan is the one most surrounded by water. And even on this infrared map, you can easily find where you live. So I always like to ask the question, how many of you live in a watershed? Uh, you know, we used to do these workshops uh, in, a, in an auditorium. Hopefully we'll get back to that someday. Um, but I would hope to see every single hand raised um, because all of you live in some sort of some area, you live in a watershed. So when we talk about watersheds, we're just talking about all the area of, the, of land that drains into a particular body of water. So when you think about it, if it rains, uh, where does that water run off to? Uh, that could be a lake, it could be a river. Uh, if you're in Southeast Michigan, um, this map shows uh, four of the major watersheds. So uh, if you're more in the uh, east side of the Metro Detroit area, you might be in the Clinton River watershed. That's the green one here. Uh, if you're in the Ann Arbor area or kind of west of the city, uh, you might be in the Huron River watershed. And if you are on the west side of Detroit or kind of the western and northern suburbs, you would be within uh, the Rouge River watershed. So focusing in a little bit um, on our watershed and you know we're always concerned about watersheds because the way that you treat the water upstream is gonna affect everybody downstream. So the Rouge River watershed drains 467, 466, 467, there's a dispute about that, um, miles of land and uh, contains portions of Oakland County, Wayne County, and then a small part of Washtenaw County. Uh, the Rouge is home to 1.35 million residents. Uh, making it one of the most or perhaps the most urbanized watershed in the state of Michigan. Um, it's got three major branches, the main, this red one here, the upper, um, starts in West Bloomfield, goes through the farming tens, um, and then you've got the middle branch, which 
probably most people are familiar with. There's the Wald Lake Branch and then Johnson Creek, which is our cold water tributary, comes together uh, in Northville. And then you've got the middle branch that goes through Heinz Park. You always hear Heinz Park is closed down when it's uh, after a rain uh, because they put the road in the floodplain. And while people get upset about that, it's actually a pretty good deal. We don't have homes that get flooded. We just have to shut down the road when the river needs to use the floodplain. And then last but not least, we've got the Lower Rouge that kind of follows along the Michigan Avenue corridor. They all come together. And then you've got the main stem, which is where most of our industry is located. Um, so a lot of people think that that industry, they have a picture of the Rouge, they think of the Ford Rouge plant, and they think that industry is responsible for most of the Rouge River's pollution. In reality, 70 to 80 percent of the water pollution in the United States comes from non-point source pollution. So stormwater runoff um, and all the pollutants that get carried into water bodies when they run off the roads. Um, and you personally can have a, a big impact on that by um, trying to retain more of the stormwater on your own property. So simple things like installing a rain barrel that takes the water from your gutters, um, or even better yet, put in a rain garden. Uh, replace long grass with native plants that, that absorb more uh, rainwater. Um, all of that uh, can really help to reduce and filter runoff. And Friends of the Rouge has, we offer training on how to install a rain garden. We have lots of volunteer days. And you can even come to our office and check out the parking lot behind our office where last couple of years we installed 20,000 square feet of rain garden. It's just an incredible thing to see. So uh, today we're really focused on wetlands. And um, you know, one of the natural processes that really helps to keep the river clean are wetlands. Uh, because the wetlands are like great big filters. Wetlands can retain and filter up to 72% of the runoff from a small storm. And this map right here um, is showing you all of the wetlands in the Rouge River watershed, at least as of 2005. And uh, you might notice that most of our wetlands are in what we call the headwaters. So this would be the outer perimeter of the watershed where the smaller creeks come together or the, where they start. So what is a wetland? Obviously, uh, a, a wetland is an area where water covers the surface for all of the year or, or maybe just for part of the year. So wetlands are one of the most productive ecosystems in the world, comparable to rainforests and coral reefs. While up to 5% of the land surface in the United States is wetlands, they contain 31% of all plant species, support almost 43% of federally listed species, endangered and special concern, 190 amphibian species, and one-third of all bird species. Um, and wetlands act like great big sponges. They protect us from flooding. They also filter and clean the water. They're like our kidneys. They absorb waste such as nitrogen and phosphorus. Like They're like Earth's kidneys. Um, so to, a wetland is defined by four different things. You know, one, I already mentioned the water, the hydrology. Um, some other things are plants. There's certain plants that you only find in wetlands that like to grow in areas where their feet stay wet. So you can see some cattails in the front of this photo. And if you're a, a wetland biologist, uh, you know a whole slew of plants like sedges and things. And these can help you identify whether it's a wetland or not because wetlands can dry out, you know, our vernal wetlands. Vernal ponds can be dry later on in the summer, but they still are considered wetlands. Um, there's some other things like soils, uh, which are kind of hard for you, you know, to see. And then lastly, wildlife. So when you see things like this, this water bird, this uh, egret, um, that's another indication, amphibians. Um, and there's many different types of wetlands. So this right here, uh, you've got the open water and that's a pond. 
Um, and then you've also got a bit of this uh, marsh type habitat with the cattails and the tall grasses. So uh, when you go to, to look for frogs and toads, um, every species has a different preference for a type of wetland. So the more variety you have, the more likely you are to have all eight of the species that we have. And in this picture, you've got a wonderful mosaic of wetlands. In the front, you've got a marsh with those cattails. You've got something in the back called scrub shrub, shrubby type wetland. And then in the far back, uh, a wooded wetland, or also sometimes called a swamp. This may not appear like a wetland, um, but if you looked closer, you would notice this is a very damp area with different type of plants. This is a wet meadow. And this is the preferred habitat of what I had just said was my favorite frogger toad, and that's the American toad. So, you know, wetlands are great, but we have lost 50% of our wetlands. Um, if you focus down in, uh, this map is showing you wetland loss since uh, we originally tracked it in the 1800s. So in Southeast Michigan, we've lost a ton of our wetlands. In Wayne County, it's 90%. Not quite as bad in Oakland County, 55%. Washtenaw County, 53%. There are regulations um, that require you to get a permit if you want to fill in a wetland and then you might have to compensate for it. Um, but these regulations are not always enforced. Uh, and the more that you can do to get involved, get to know your local wetlands. And when you hear about developments or you see changes, to make sure that when these things go in that um, the wetlands are not harmed. So in the Rouge, not only have we drained, filled and developed most of the wetlands, we've actually paved over more than half of the watershed. So this map right here is showing you what percent of the land in the watershed is uh, impervious, meaning, you know, paved over rooftops, roads, parking lots, buildings. Uh, the, the purple is, is really developed and the dark blue is, you know, almost 100% paved over. When you pave over land like that, it no longer has the ability to absorb and filter rainwater and it all runs off damaging our river uh, you think about the Rouge, it's a very flashy river because of all this pavement. So when it rains, the river goes way up and then comes down pretty quickly. That causes a lot of erosion and then sediment in the water, making it very difficult for fish and other things that breathe with gills to survive in the system. That's one of the biggest problems with our river. And then also all those contaminants like oil, um, antifreeze, road salt, uh, fertilizer, things like that cause big problems in the river. Um, and recently I asked one of my coworkers uh, to look at a map. This is a map showing uh, the percent of impervious surfaces in 2011. And then he just updated this for 2019. And I'm gonna put that one on. Um, it may not look that different to you, but I'm gonna do a little bit of flashing back and forth. And if you notice out here, um, back in 2011, those areas like up here and up here, you can see how we are continuing to pave over what open land we have. Um, and this is just continuing to cause problems for our watershed. So, um, on to the frogs and toads. Um, these here are toad tadpoles. So amphibians, frogs, toads, salamanders, mud puppies, newts, uh, they're all very, very sensitive since they absorb everything through their skin. So they require clean water for the part of their life cycle when they're like fish, as well as when they transform into frogs or toads where they also require good quality upland habitat. So, um, that's why they're such great indicator species. Their presence or absence is a good indication of the health of the habitat. 
So in 1998, Friends of the Rouge was looking for a way to train volunteers to survey wetlands. And rather than have people survey for standing water, wetland plants, soils, we decided to choose a species and animals whose presence would be a good indication of good quality wetlands and indicator species. And um, you know, of course, amphibians are a great choice. We could have asked you to go out and look for salamanders, and a lot of people do that, and it's kind of a fun thing to do, but that causes a lot of disturbance to the environment, and it's a pretty difficult thing to do. Frogs and toads, on the other hand, have this you know, great habit of calling in the spring, uh, calling to find each other, and the calls can be very loud. So we realized we could train people to survey for frogs and toads simply by listening for their calls. So for our survey, you don't have to see them. You don't need to touch them. In fact, we don't want you to touch them because you can spread diseases and actually harm them. All you have to do is listen. All you have to do is learn to identify eight calls. So we have 14 species in Michigan, and in this part of the state, we only have eight that we're going to ask you to identify, eight distinctive ones. Um, so it's nothing like if, if you're a birder and you try to identify bird calls, there's you know, 100 different species you might hear. Frogs and toads are a lot simpler, so it uh, makes it quite a bit easier. And when you go to learn frog and toad calls, it's always best to start with the early calling species, the ones that might start calling in even this year as early as the end of February, usually more like early March into April. Um, learn those calls first uh, because those will be the first ones to, to start calling. Uh, the later season species don't really start calling until it's more consistently like 60 degrees. So most of the spring calling species like to use a certain type of wetland called a vernal pond. So these are ponds that hold water in the spring, snow melt, uh, and will hold water into the summer, but depending on the year, might dry up. And the unique thing about that is unlike a permanent pond, these ponds don't really support fish. And fish can be pretty big predators of eggs, of tadpoles, and even the, the small frogs. And most of the spring species are, are tiny little guys. Um, so, and vernal ponds are probably one of the most threatened habitats that we have because if you are out there in late summer, you might not even recognize it as a wetland. And um, some of you might be familiar with a new initiative called the Vernal Pool Partnership in Michigan. Friends of the Rouge has recently signed up to be a partner with that group. And you know, we'll send you out some information for that. They have some trainings uh, on vernal ponds if you'd like to add that to what, to what you're doing with the survey. So here's our first early calling species. And um, like I said, for the survey, you don't need to recognize the frog by what it looks like. But if you do see this frog, this is called the wood frog. Uh, and you uh, recognize it by the black mask behind the eye. Um, you don't really want to recognize frogs by color because it varies a lot. And in wood frogs, the males are blue and the females are red. So we have a lovely male frog here. Wood frog, uh, wood frog, you know, they're called wood frogs because they like to live in the woods and they are obligate users of vernal ponds. So obligate meaning that's the only type of wetland that they will use. So if you don't have any vernal ponds in your area, you probably will not have uh, wood frogs. Um, so wood frogs are one of the very earliest uh, species to start calling. And they're what we call explosive breeders. So not that they explode, but when they start calling in the spring, um, they all tend to come out at the same time and they will call for maybe a week or two and do all of their breeding in a short period of time. That's different than some of the later calling species like the green frogs, they'll, they'll call and breed for three months straight. 
the wood frog, that's not the case. So that's why if you're going to do this survey, we ask you to get out a little more frequently in the spring, because if you're not out there during that week or two period, you're going to miss them. So uh, we were talking earlier, most frogs don't say ribbit. Uh, the wood frog, uh, its call has been likened to um, ducks quacking, uh, chickens clucking, or turkeys. So I'm going to play it for you, see what you think. So that is just a, a fun frog to hear. And um, I wanted to show you a quick video because uh, you think about what are these frogs doing right now? It's what, about 32 degrees out. It's been really cold. What do they do all winter? And a few of our local Michigan species like the, the wood frog can actually freeze solid over the winter and it does not harm them. Now, if that happened to us, we would be dead. So a lot of people are studying this ability that they have. So I'm going to play you this short video about freezing frogs. Here's the thing about North American wood frogs. They're small. So it might be very difficult to spot a frog. Very small, but they're everywhere, just out of view, hiding on the forest floor. You guys he's, he's camouflaged. Oh, there we go. His coloration is the same as the soil around him. You see him here? He's cold. You can find them here in Southern Ohio and all the way up to the Arctic Circle. But wherever they are, once it gets cold with the first sprinkle of ice, this frog does something I didn't know was possible. As soon as the frog touches, just touches an ice crystal. This animal is going to freeze. Freeze, freeze? Freeze, solid freeze. That touch of ice immediately sets off signals inside the frog, says Professor John Costanzo, that pulls water away from the center of its body so the frog's internal organs are now wrapped in a puddle of water that then turns to solid ice. I, I, I still can't get over it. it. It's really an amazing, amazing thing. There is no breathing, no kidney function. The heart stops. And there will be no heartbeat for a long period of time. You mean as in no heartbeat? Right. Nothing. Flatline. Flatline. For an hour or two? It could be for days, perhaps even weeks. Really? It sounds like it's virtually dead, no? We know that the frog isn't dead, but he's probably about as close as you can get to being dead. Yes. <laughs> so from the outside, this little frog feels like a rock. Except that as it froze, the frog flooded itself with a kind of sugar. The frog's blood sugar is distributed through the circulatory system. It works like an antifreeze. It's harder for the water to freeze, so cells stay just damp enough for the animal to hold itself together. Until the springtime. When the days grow a little longer, and the ground gets a little warmer, and then, well, a kind of miracle happens. After weeks or months of no heartbeat, none, suddenly there's a pulse. And that first heartbeat leads to another, and then another. And then within a day, and in the case of this little frog, it took about mm, 10 hours, the animal literally comes back to life. spontaneous resumption of function. Why? We don't know. We don't know what triggers that event. And think how elegant a business this is. Because although the sun is warming up the outside of this little guy, somehow his insides, his heart, his brain, they thaw first 
His insides warm up before his outsides. But somehow, it all happens in perfect synchrony every spring. Yes, and it's going to undertake a very energetic activity. It's mating time. You mean hours after it thaws, it's going to do it with a lady? It's going to perform. <laughs> what an animal! Can we say that on? I don't know whether we can or not. <laughs> well, we just did. Just going to stop share. Those the, those guys kind of cracked me up. Um, let me just stop share to get back into our presentation here. Uh, hold on a second. Okay, here we go. Go back to sharing my screen. slideshow. Uh, okay, great. Um, so, uh, hey, I, I think that video, they're a little launchy there, huh? But, you know, hey, we're pretty close to Valentine's Day, so that's, that's what it's all about. They're coming out looking for love. So this map right here is showing you where you might find wood frogs. Uh, so as I mentioned earlier, uh, the, the headwaters are where most of our wetlands are, and that's going to be the healthiest parts of our watershed. Uh, with the wood frogs. Uh, we don't find them as much in the more developed part of the watershed and also, you know, they're associated with wooded wetlands. So if you don't have a forested area, you, you might not have them. Um, I was checking the chat as, as we were moving along and some comments about the Vernal Pool Partnership. And I'm really happy to have Abby Point Pointer who um, works with that partnership on today. And uh, she shared the link, and we will also share that with you. They are associated with the Michigan Natural Features Inventory, too. Um, great project. So anyway, that's wood frogs. Um, this map, uh, we probably undercount them a little bit because uh, people might not be out there at the right time. So like I said, if you do the survey and you start in March, you want to get out there a little bit more often. The commitment for the survey is just a couple times a month, but in March, April, a little bit more often. So moving on to our second species, this is uh, the Midland chorus frog. We used to call him the Western chorus frog, but we've had a lot of consultations with Jim Harding. He's a MSU uh, expert professor who wrote a book on frogs and toads. And our species, our local species, we call the Midland chorus frog. So this is one of our tiniest little frogs. You can see uh, it's right there close to somebody's fingernail. They do not get a whole lot bigger than your thumbnail. Uh, one of our tiniest frogs. And um, they are users of vernal ponds. They like them fairly open and sunny. Uh, you are very unlikely to see them because they are so tiny and I have tried to find them before and they're calling like crazy and they're just so difficult to find. But if you do find one, they're very similar in size to the spring peeper, but they have stripes down the back, whereas the peeper has a cross. And uh, chorus frogs, if you don't hear the wood frogs, chorus frogs are probably the first frog that you're going to hear in the spring. Um, and they're, they're fairly common throughout the watershed. Their call is likened to taking your thumb and running it over the top of a comb. So that kind of... They do call at the same time and often in the same habitat as spring peepers. We'll I'll talk about it in a minute. The peepers just say their name peep, but the chorus frogs do more of a t -t -t. So I'm going to play the call now, see if you can distinguish them. There are some peepers in there too. So you'll probably need to practice a little bit just to distinguish that peep, 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 and that t -t 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 -t. 
of the chorus frog. Uh, and when Kathy shows you the app, you'll have a great tool to practice with. So uh, chorus frogs are fairly ubiquitous around the watershed. Uh, I do remember back when Friends of the Rouge's office was down in Dearborn, and uh, near U of M Dearborn, and we never heard them down there. And they actually seem to have increased their populations in that area. Now, if you're driving through there in the spring, uh, you will, you'll hear them. Um, so about half of our survey blocks have Midland chorus frogs. And like I said, they will probably be the first frog for you to hear uh, as soon as the ice gets off the ponds. One thing about chorus frogs, we tell you to do these surveys after dark because that's the maximum calling time for frogs and toads. Some frogs still do call during the day, including the chorus frogs. So, uh, and if you're having trouble distinguishing them from the peepers, you might want to visit your site during the day just because they tend to call and the peepers are more likely to call at night. So it's a little bit easier to tell them apart. So Midland chorus frog. Here is our third species. It's our smallest species and it's our loudest. I always say, know anybody like that? I'm sure you do. Uh, spring peepers, again, don't get much bigger than your thumbnail. You can distinguish them from the chorus frogs because they have a, a cross on the back. Their uh, Latin name, their scientific name is Hylocrucifer. Um, and spring peepers like to use vernal ponds. They like them a little bit um, more vegetated than the chorus frogs, uh, but you will oftentimes find them in similar habitat. They don't start as early in the spring, a little bit later into March, early April, and uh, they're really easy to learn the call because they just say their name or some people call them a jingle bell frog. We've done presentations for fifth grade classes and use jingle bells to illustrate them. So here they go. I had to turn up the volume on that a little bit. Um, I don't know as you got the sense of that. Uh, let me just start them again here. Uh, yeah, I don't know what's going on with the recording. Uh, anyway, spring peepers, like all frogs, uh, you know, they can't produce their own body heat. So when it's cold, they're not moving around as much. And so in the early spring, they'll start out and you'll hear, you know, a peeper or two. And then as it gets warmer, they'll start calling more vigorously and you'll get this full chorus that can just be so loud. Uh, some people complain about the sounds of the frogs and this one is probably the most guilty party because they, they do make a very loud noise, but such a welcome, welcome sign of spring. Uh, and similar to the chorus frogs, uh, little, not quite half of all survey blocks have reported spring peepers. Uh, I love seeing this block right here. That's actually the Ford Rouge plant. They had them calling by the Ford Rouge plant. They recreated some wetlands and the spring peepers are there. So, so what a thing. Um, as we restore our environment, they will come back. So that's the spring peeper. And now moving on to what I did admit is my favorite the American toad. So we only have one toad in Southeast Michigan. Uh, we, we were talking about the Fowler's uh, toad a little bit before we got started. Uh, you can hear that on the recordings that we have, but they are limited to uh, interdunal wetlands. So you kind of have to go over to the west side of the state to hear them. We don't have them in this area, although I have been told they're at Crosswinds Marsh, but after over 20 years of doing this survey, we know that they're not in the Rouge River watershed. So if you have a toad, it's an American toad. How are frogs and toads different? Well, toads uh, have drier, bumpy, warty skin, and they also have shorter legs so that they're not very good jumpers, which is part of what connects them to the type of habitat that you find them in. They don't like a lot of vegetation. So you're gonna find them in those, that wet meadow that I showed you. Uh, and they're not really very particular. They will use roadside ditches, golf course ponds, if they don't use a lot of uh, herbicides. This is the one that you're probably gonna find in your backyard. 
And, you know, these are indicators of wetland quality, but they're also in indicators of upland habitat. A lot of people say, well, I have toads in my backyard and I don't have any wetlands for miles around. They spend most of their life not in the pond. They just need the ponds during their breeding season and then they'll leave. And, you know, some people like to put in these, you know, preformed or just uh, create a backyard pond that actually can create great habitat. I did that in my backyard. Um, first couple of years, we had a couple of toads um, and now we have them coming back every year. And in fact, last couple of years, we've had a bit of a drought down in the park where I'm close to. And we've had a whole lot more of them using our pond because it's a bit of habitat that they can use. Um, so American toads, um, you know, like open habitat, wet meadows, they start calling uh, around April 15th. You know, people dread that day, tax day, and instead we want to officially call it toad day because that's when they're not so much when they start, but when they're calling most vigorously in the area. Their call is a, a burst of a trill. So I'll play that now. So I have had fifth graders say that sounds like a scary sound. Uh, I don't think it's scary because I, I love the sound and, you know, I live in a more urbanized area. So that's the one that I mostly hear. So, you know, 60%, I think our numbers were even higher last year on American toads. They're, they're fairly ubiquitous. Uh, they can tolerate. Um, even some degraded conditions. So not meaning that it's a bad time, sign that you have them, but if your wetland only has American toads, it's probably not terribly healthy, um, but at least we have those toads there. So uh, what's it all about? We were talking about Valentine's Day. That's coming up pretty soon, and that is what it's all about. They're not singing for our benefit. They are singing so that they can find each other and only the males call and they wake up first and head out to the ponds and try to find the best spot in the pond and the biggest, healthiest of the animals will get the best spot. And they'll set up shop and uh, the calling will attract the females. The females generally don't make any noises, maybe an alarm call, but they don't do the calling. Uh, in this picture right here, uh, you actually, the larger toad there on the bottom is the female, and that's the male on top. This is called Amplexus. Uh, he's fertilizing the eggs that she is laying that you can see in a string right here. And that is the third difference between frogs and toads. Frogs lay their eggs in clumps. Toads lay their eggs in strings. And if you have a good breeding population of toads in your area, you can actually really see this happening. Sometimes the eggs have some reddish on them. You can see those eggs. Uh, it's just a really amazing thing to see. And the males will fight over the females. Sometimes you'll have several males kind of piling up there. Um, so it's spring, it's coming. So moving on to the later season frogs, these, these are the more traditional frogs that you think of, the larger ones. Most of these need to use permanent ponds uh, in part like the, the last two, the green frogs and the bullfrogs. Their tadpoles take a couple of years before they transform. So they can't use those vernal ponds that dry up. Uh, so most of them use permanent ponds like this, and um, but they need a lot of vegetation in the pond. So a lot of people like lakefront property and they tend to want to clear every bit of vegetation so they can have a nice beach. The more vegetation that you can leave, the healthier it is for the frogs and toads. So sure, you know, make your, make your nice view, make your area, you can have a beach, but leave some for these animals that, that share this world with us. So here's our first one. Uh, this is showing the camouflage and this frog is named after the leopard. So the Northern leopard frog, it's got spots like a leopard. I guess that's why they called it the leopard frog. 
And uh, here's a, a close up. Uh, if you did a dissection in science class, it probably was a northern leopard frog. Uh, they're one of our larger frogs. Um, and they're actually one of the most sensitive frogs that we have. Uh, over the years, they've, they've really declined in Michigan. Um, they, they used to be really common in our area, according to reports I get from old timers. Um, so if you have these in your area, it's, it's a really good sign, one with the wood frogs. So leopard frogs uh, start they're kind of in between the early and the late, so they'll start you know, maybe May. And they like to use both vernal ponds as well as permanent ponds. They really like the sunny edges of lakes. And I think they have the weirdest call. It's uh, kind of like a snore. So I'll play that one for you. Let me make sure the sound is up. So some of you veterans might have uh, heard there's some toads in the background. As you get later in the season, it's hard to just have one species. Uh, we have used, like uh, when we were doing this thing with fifth graders, we've even used a balloon, rubbing on a balloon. That's sort of what the sound uh, sounds like. Um, so anyway, you can see like 9% of survey blocks, they are very rare uh, in the watershed. So. Um, like I said, if you do have them, you're, you're very lucky to have them. They also, you know, we tell you to do your surveys at night. This is one that uh, I had one survey area. I didn't even hear them until midnight. Um, so you do need to be out there uh, when it's dark to hear northern leopard frogs. So moving on to our next species, it's gray and it's on a tree. So this is the gray tree frog. Um, although they're not always gray like chameleons, they change color. So when they first transform from tadpoles, they're going to be bright green. And then over time, they develop the ability to turn into this gray color. Um, you know, I did want to go back a minute to the leopard frog. Um, on, we only ask you to survey for the leopard frog. We also have a closely related one called the pickerel frog, which we haven't really confirmed in the watershed. It has a similar call. Um, similar to a uh, similar thing with the gray tree frog, there's a copse gray tree frog, but the call of the copse gray tree frog and the eastern gray tree frog are so similar. Um, and depending on the temperature, uh, they can so easily be confused and you really can't tell them apart very well. Um, so we just lump them all together and we just call them gray tree frogs. Um, that's all we're asking you to be able to identify. So uh, tree frogs, like wood frogs, their preferred habitat is wooded, but unlike wood frogs, they use permanent ponds. Um, so they need that, that high quality wooded wetland uh, they don't really start calling until May, and the call is a, a burst of a trill. So, here we go. So, that's the gray tree frog. Um, yeah, I love that call. It is one that oftentimes gets confused with uh, some of the insects because they call later in the in the spring when it's a little bit warmer and you do have some of the insects, the crickets and maybe even cicadas starting to call and they're calling up in the tree. So a lot of people said, well, I've heard, been hearing that thing for years and I always thought it was some sort of insect. Well, no, it's, it's they, they'll call from 10 feet up in the tree. Um, but they do need to be close to a pond for, for breeding. So uh, they're fairly common, not as common as the chorus of the spring peepers. Um, and you can see there's this whole urban area that we don't really have them in. And I'm not entirely sure why. I think they're a little bit more sensitive. 
Um, you know, they're uh, tree frogs. Uh, spring peepers are also tree frogs, so they have uh, little pads on their feet and they can actually climb up walls and things. So people tell stories of seeing them on their front porch uh, close to a porch light because they, one of their favorite foods are moths and things that get attracted by the light. Um, so these are very charismatic little frogs if you have them. Uh, moving on to our second to laugh frog. This is the green frog and uh, focusing in a little better picture there. So, oops. So green frogs are our second to largest frog. Uh, they're pretty well aquatic, so they don't spend much time outside of the pond. Um, they're fairly large. Uh, with our bigger frogs, you can tell the males from the females based on the size of the eardrum or the typhanum. So this one, uh, the males have much larger eardrums than the eye. The females, the eardrum is a little bit more similar to the size of the eye. So I guess that's because the males uh, need to hear each other, get out, all get out to the pond and start calling so that they can find the females. Um, green frogs use permanent ponds um, with some vegetation. Uh, if you walk by a pond and a frog jumps in, chances are it's a green frog. Uh, could be a bullfrog, but our green frogs are far more common than bullfrogs. Um, they don't start calling until it's consistently 60 degrees. So, you know, depending on that year, it could be May, June, um, sometimes maybe not even until July. Um, the call is pretty easy to learn. It's like a twang, like a banjo string. So here we go. And you'll hear them kind of calling back and forth. These ones don't have so much of a chorus. This is Lara's favorite. So that's that's the green frog. And uh, when we started the survey and we were just focused more on one part of the watershed, we didn't hear that many. Um, but when you look at the entire uh, watershed, they're really fairly common, a little less than 50% uh, of the blocks. And they're, they're like the toad. These are ones that are a little less sensitive. So if you only have two species calling in your block, it's probably gonna be the American toad and green frogs. And they also, I mean, they've been known to be a little less, a little more tolerant to pollution. They can fall into a heavily chlorinated swimming pool and survive, which wouldn't happen with your smaller, more sensitive frogs. Um, so just a little bit tougher, um, but, but also good to have around. So uh, we are at our last species. So this is the bullfrog. I told you about the size of the eye and the eardrum. So you see this frog has the eye and the eardrum are very similar in size. So this would be a female bullfrog. Uh, the way that you tell them from the green frog, because they're very similar in size, is that the bullfrog has smooth skin behind the eye. Um, the, go back to the green frog. You see this dorsolateral fold of skin that tells you it's a green frog. On the bullfrog, it's just completely smooth. Um, so these guys are large and um, all frogs are predators. They will eat what they can catch. And because bullfrogs get so large, uh, they'll even eat birds. And I have had volunteers report that the bullfrog in their backyard caught a bird. What should they do? It's what they're eating. They're eating lunch. Go ahead and let them do that. Um, you might be alarmed by it, but it's 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 not unusual. Um, bullfrogs are are not a bad thing to have, but um, and they're native to Michigan. But uh, people have brought them to other parts of the world, and since they do eat just about anything, including other frogs, other tadpoles, uh, other. Um, eggs of frogs, uh, they, they're actually causing a dent in other native species in other parts of the world. So we don't recommend moving them around, but they're not a bad thing to have in your backyard. Um, but they will eat some of the smaller frogs. Uh, you really need a big area for them. So they, they need permanent ponds like the green frogs. They, their tadpoles take a couple years before they transform. 
Um, they need a pretty deep area um, and they also have a pretty big predator base, so you would not expect to have a large population of them. Um, and they are the latest species to start calling. So we ask you to survey uh, through July. One year we, we started limiting that, like you'd be fine if you just survey through June. Um, but especially if you're in the more northern part of the watershed, they might not start calling for you until July. So uh, the bullfrog has a fun little call. Um, I'm looking for where uh, I can play it for you. Um, it's kind of a, a um, rum, rum, rum. Um, looks like I don't have that on there. So I guess I'm not gonna be playing that one. Or you, I could cheat on the quiz. I'm going to cheat on the quiz here. So let's see if this works. So that is our bullfrog, and uh, you probably heard some of the twangs of the green frog there too, and then the bullfrog kind of rum, 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 rum. Uh, so bullfrogs are not that common, um, but I wouldn't be concerned about it um, because like I said, they need a pretty big predator base. So you wouldn't expect them to be that common in an area, even if it's in, in really good shape. Um, you know, and, and we've even found some interesting urban bullfrogs down here in the Dearborn Hills Golf Course where they actually irrigate the ponds um, by taking water from the river, keeping water in it year round. And we have some huge bullfrogs out there. Um, so they can survive even in some pretty urban areas. So that was our last species. And now I just wanted to show you a map. Um, this map has all of the survey blocks that have been surveyed over time. So all of those squares, somebody listened and the light areas are, way be, are where maybe one or two species were heard. Um, and then the darker blue that it gets, the more species. So you can see uh, our real pockets of diversity are you know, up in the headwaters regions, um, Troy, West Bloomfield, Lakes region, wall around those awesome wetlands around Wald Lake, uh, and then out in the west side of Novi, uh, Northville, Salem, Superior Township, and even into Canton. Although, you know, I was showing you that impervious surfaces map and a lot of these areas are under some pretty serious development pressure right now. So we just really need to make sure that those wetlands are protected. So that was it uh, for the frogs and toads. So uh, are you ready for a quiz? I'm hoping so. So, uh, and then we'll take some questions. I, I see some, some hands going up. So, uh, um, Sam is, uh, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna play one of these for you and then Sam is gonna put up uh, poll number one. And so listen to the call and see if you can figure out uh, what it is. And I think our very first one, we're just asking you to identify one. If you do well on that, then we'll let you go on to quiz number two and identify the two. Um, so here we go. I'm going to play it and Sam will put up that poll.
All right. Think about 53 of you answered. You, uh... Okay, uh, Sam, do you want to go ahead and uh, share share the results of the poll? Can you do that? Oh, okay. Okay, you can see that now. So uh, those of you who chose American Toad, which was a lot of you who were sure right from the beginning, you are correct. So that was the trills of the American Toad. Uh, and some people, uh, 15 people thought maybe that was the Midland Chorus Frog. Um, it's a trill, but the chorus frog is more of a t -t 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 -t. Uh, The wood frog is more of that quack. The spring peeper is just peep, peep, peep. And then of course the leopard frog is that snore. So great job. Uh, I think I'm gonna let you go on to poll number two. So here we go. And this one actually has two callers, so you can make two choices here. If you only know one, that's fine. See how you can do on this. You know what? I was wrong. This one just has the one. Okay, so uh, looks like 46 people said wood frog, and you are correct. That was the, the quacking or the, the chicken clucking or the turkey clucking, like my mom always said. A um, uh, few people thought maybe that was the green frog. The green frog is more of the pluck of the banjo string. Um, the bullfrog is the rum, rum, rum. And the chorus frog, of course, is the t -t -t -t, like the running of your finger on a comb. So good job. I am going to do one more challenge for you. Then we'll go on to some questions. And I think this one actually has two. Let's we'll see what we got here. Yes, this has two. So see if you can name the main one and an additional one. Can't wait to start doing this. Yeah, we also do get some competition with the birds. Um, okay, well, uh, looks like most of you have answered. And uh, those of you who said spring peeper were correct, the peep, peep, peep. And then you also had the t -t -t in the background, uh, also calling the Midland Chorus Frog, so the comb frog. So some of you said gray tree frog. The trill is a little bit similar, but the, that, that's more of a, a burst kind of a trill. Um, green frog again is the banjo string. Oh, that's funny. We have two green frogs on there. Oops. Um, anyway, you guys did a, did a great job. So congratulations. Uh, I'm going to do a stop share uh, for the moment and uh, see if there are any questions. So, Lara, Sam, do you have any yes. questions for us? Yes, a few questions have come in throughout the presentation. So we will start with uh, uh, someone said, I really want to have a career helping these wetlands and helping restore them. Uh, does Friends of the Rouge have any advice on how to do this? Uh, great question. Um, I'm not sure uh, what you're studying right now, but I'd highly encourage you to, uh, to um, 
go to college and uh, get a degree in uh, environmental, silent, uh, environmental science, um, wetland ecology, uh, specialize. Um, you know, we're at a time right now where there are so many positions opening up, uh, even in the biological field. So, um, and there's a lot of different um, positions that you might have. Um, you know, it kind of depends uh, which 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 way you want to go. Um, the uh, uh, Great Lakes, what we call Eagle now, Environment, Great Lakes and Energy, the State Department that kind of regulates wetlands. They oftentimes have openings for people that work in regulation, um, so help to enforce uh, those permits that I was talking about. Um, there's also a lot of consulting firms that do work to preserve wetlands. There's groups like the Vernal Pools Partnership or Michigan Natural Features Inventory. Um, so I would say get the education and look around. There's a whole lot of opportunities um, or even working for an organization like Friends of the Rivers like Sam and I are working on this survey. So great question. And I hope you, you do find a career in it. We could use more good people out there. Awesome. All right. Next question is, um, vernal ponds sound pretty vital. Uh, is there an effort within the Vernal Pond Partnership to restore vernal ponds and parks and reserves around the watershed? You know, that is a great question. I am not sure if Abby is, uh, is still on the call. Um, and if she would want to answer that question, um, I know that they do a lot of survey work around it. Um, it's, I don't actually know if they do any work to restore vernal ponds, uh, but I think it would be a great idea. I don't think at this point um, they're doing any work to restore any, but a great idea. Yeah, exactly. Okay, maybe, maybe you and I should talk about that. Um, because uh, vernal ponds, uh, forested wetlands are the most common habitat that we have in the Rich River watershed. So, great thing to work on. So, thanks, Abby. Um, and I see a few people. Uh, we still have a little bit more to cover about the survey, um, but I just wanted to answer a few more questions. Um, and I think I'm just going to read these now. So, Carol is asking Are all frogs and toads able to freeze? Um, no, no. I I, I know the wood frogs are and uh, spring peepers, and I think the chorus frogs, um, but I think the, uh, the uh, um, bigger ones are not able to do that. Uh, they just kind of bury underground. Um, somebody said, did you say that bullfrog tadpoles take years to develop? Uh, Rosina is asking that, and yes, that is correct. Uh, you'll see these gigantic tadpoles sometimes, um, and those will be in the pond for two years. I think some of them could even take three years. Um, where would you recommend going to hear the majority of these frogs? If you sign up for the survey, we will assign you an area um, close to where you live, which doesn't mean it's the best area. Um, our headwaters region, uh, we have some great habitat up around West Bloomfield Woods. We're actually going to do a group listen up there, Wild Lake area, and then out uh, Superior Salem Township. If you drive around out there in the spring, you'll hear a lot of things. Um, and then last one, we choose wherever we want to to listen for them. So we assign you a quarter square mile area, and I, I will get to, I'll get to the details of that uh, in a minute. Um, but we tend to try to assign you something close to where you live um, so we're not making you travel too far at night. If you're outside of the watershed, you're certainly going to have to travel. Um, and we also have some areas that may be farther for you um, that are more desirable areas and parks and things. It also kind of depends whether you're in a really urban area and there are wetlands because we don't, you know, we want to make sure that you have some, some wetlands to survey. Um, and then I guess I'll take, take the last question, wondering about climate change and frog hibernation. What do 50 to 60 degree in February days to do to frogs? Um, you know, these frogs are pretty well adapted to the changing environment. And so there's a few more cues than just the temperature that will stimulate them to, to actually wake up and start hopping around. 
Um, but we do sometimes have problems if it gets really, really warm and the water temperatures uh, warm up, they come out and then we get a deep freeze. Uh, they can die. Um, actually, the thing that's probably the most common is if we have a really long, cold, hard freeze to the winter and the ponds freeze so solid for so long that it robs the oxygen um, from the ponds. And then those years, you actually do have a lot of uh, things like green frogs turning up dead and fish. Um, so great question. Um, I am going to now uh, turn it over to Kathy Abelson. Uh, who is going to uh, talk a little bit about this really wonderful app that she designed. So Kathy, are you ready to share your screen there? I am, thank you, Sally. Um, as Sally talked about um, surveying, and I, it sounds like about a third of the people have already surveyed, but um, I did a survey probably 10 or 12, maybe even longer ago um, with my teenage son. And first of all, there are two things I distinctly remember about that initial survey. One of them, uh, our area included a golf course and we had <clears throat> done our prep work ahead of time and we talked to the golf course manager and um, he okayed it, us coming um, to do our listening. And also um, we were ready. We, we had our clipboard, we had everything we needed. At that time it was clipboards and um, we drove up to the golf course and the gate was down and it was locked. Um, some sort of miscommunication between me and the um, golf course manager. He didn't realize we'd be coming at night, but there was a clearance under the gate of about two feet. So my son being a teenager immediately dropped, rolled under the gate and sprung up and was on halfway to the first tee when he said, um, come on, mom. Okay. So I'm listening to frogs now, I guess. And um, rolling under gates is not typically something I do, but um, in the interest of being a citizen scientist, I rolled under the gate, caught up with him. We had our first survey, we did okay, um, but it was wet out and because it was late spring. Um, and it is something I don't do often, but remember distinctly about that. So it makes it impossible Impression, no matter even just the total experience, even listening, listening to the frogs, but the total experience being out there, the nature and contributing. Um, the second thing I remember most about that first experience was the fact that I had a really hard time learning the calls initially, like learning them, remembering them, committing them and associating them with which frog we were talking about here. So um, at so because at that time we you used a CD to learn them. There wasn't um, this type of technology. So about a four or five years ago, maybe, I think I was working on, I do some um, web development. So I was working on developing a different app that used sound and I wanted something very simple to test um, the applications of the sound that I would use in that more complex app, something simple. So I remembered back when I was trying to learn the frog and toad calls that it was hard for me. And so I, I thought, well, if I develop an app, maybe it would be a little bit easier. So I just did the couple frogs at first, but then I had a lot of people in the scientific community, including my son and his wife, um, Ian and Jess Abelson, and then Sally encouraging, and she put me in touch with Jim Harding, and they all encouraged me to, to do a more, a fuller and more robust app um, that would hopefully uh, help others in, in the survey and, and just general knowledge of frog and toad. Um, learn the calls and, and learn more deeply something about um, the, the habitats and the calling times and everything else with the frog and toads in Michigan. So let me share my screen and I'll show you a little bit about the app, how you can access it and, um, and the different um, options you have on it. Okay, so this is um, the first screen you come up with if you just type in froggyvoice.com into your web browser. So that's the thing about this particular app. It's a um, 
it's not a specific app for an Android or for an iPhone. Um, it works in a web browser. So you can access it on your Android or iPhone, but you access it through your browser, like for example, your Chrome on your Android or um, on so probably Safari on your iPhone. So you just type in froggyvoice.com. You have to agree to the terms and conditions, and then you enter your site. Um, so this is, basic app, I want to say, so you, So I'm entering this, I'm accessing this right now from a laptop. Um, so this is the full screen of it, but it is a fully responsive app. So if you're, for example, accessing it on your um, iPad, it might look more like that, might look more like this, depending on the width of your screen. And on your phone, it probably would look more like this. So you just get one frog or toad at a time. Um, let me put it back out in the full. So to learn the calls, you can basically just press the, this is in single caller mode. Um, you can basically just press the um, button, pause it as many times as you want. Um, hopefully you're a quicker study than I was and you won't need to press it too much. Um, got our spoon paper. Got our American Toad, who seems to be a big favorite today. Um, and you can also do a multicolor mode because as Sally pointed out, a lot of times you hear more than one frog calling. So this trains your ear to get used to, um, you know, a literal, literal chorus of frogs. So you can have your, did I do multi? So you can have your wood frog and your spring peeper. I don't know if you'd have your Midland. Um, yep. Oh, that already includes the spring fevers. And then you can take one out if you want. We don't need that. because, And you can just listen to those two together. Again, just practicing through your ear, training it up so that you're you know, ready when you go out to survey. Um, the also on the app, it also has, oh, and after that, if you're, if you're, if you've got a few open, this reset buddy button is kind of handy. It just brings you back to the single collar mode. Um, if you, yeah, oh, Sally, when I took this to her um, to see if it would be useful for her volunteers, she really encouraged it to be even a more fully developed app. And she um, said, why don't we put some information on um, about each frog and toad on the screens? And so we decided to put um, the habitat, general habitat, and about what season they're calling and one kind of fun fact about each frog or toad. Um, and so you can access those too. And that information came from Jim Harding's um, book. He, he has written kind of the quintessential book on the um, uh, Michigan frogs and toads. And um, he's a uh, Michigan State. He was, uh, Professor Harding was tremendously helpful in the development of this app. Um, there are also a couple that say species of special concern, just to remind anyone who's out there um, that we need to pay attention uh, to the habitats and the health of these frogs and toads. Uh, also, the other thing about this particular app is that I drew the frogs just kind of to be a, a visual reminder to associate the sound with that visual. Uh, they're not actual depictions of the frogs and toads, but they do generally have one uh, defining characteristic each. So, for example, the wood frog, he's got his mask. He's, I don't know, I think he's kind of the burglar frog. Um, and the American toad has single wart in each spot versus the father's toad that has three or more warts in each spot. So those are, and oh, and the spring peeper's got his cross there, you can see. So those are just little reminders there. Um, as you, hopefully you'll find some use out of it. If you find that it's not displaying properly on your phone or your laptop or anything like that, you can go to this button, it's suggestions and let me know, I, I would be able to get that and hopefully be able to address the situation or maybe contact you to see exactly which device you're using and what the problem is. Or if you have any other suggestions, I'm happy to hear them. Um, the development, I think I said, 
right is you see you it, it's free to um to access you don't have to and you can access it as many times as you want it you don't have to download it from your phone you just go to the website and click on the terms and conditions and then you're in um I hope I didn't miss anything. Sally, is there something I missed this time? I think you covered everything really well. Thank you. And I don't know if you're seeing all the, the hearts and the congratulations <laughs> you're getting and the people are uh, saying what a what a really cool thing this is. Uh, a couple people are asking if you need to go to the app store to get this. Oh, so you don't because it's, it's actually, it's called a, a web app as opposed to a specific phone app. And so it's available off of the web. It's it, at one time, maybe apps were trending in that direction, but there's it, there's kind of an impasse. I don't know which way the field will go, but this particular one lent itself to development that way. Um, that way it didn't have to develop a proprietary one for an iPhone and a different one for an Android version, although, and this will work on both. And it will also, as I said, work in your, uh, I can't get this. Let me see if I can share a screen. So all you have to do, if you're on your phone, if you're in your lap, a laptop and you're practicing at home or something like that, you just go to, let me see if it'll come up. Yep. And, and then it, you can access it that way. Just agree, enter your site. That's basically what I just did. Or I, I had it preloaded though, um, but now that's what you would do. Um, Diane was saying she just saves it in her notes so she can go to it on her phone. Oh, even better. Good idea, yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kathy. I mean, it speaks speaks really well for uh, what she did. The fact that uh, James Harding, who teaches herpetology at MSU, uh, thought this was great. In fact, he uh, had his students use it for their class. Um, so, and I, I love the drawings that she did. Kathy's quite the artist. Um, and, and I love that she picked up on those characteristics that you want to focus in on to help identify them. Um, I do want to say she designed this for all of Michigan, so there's a few on there that I mentioned that um, we don't really have, like the Fowler's Toad. But you know, if you travel up north uh, or go over to the west side of the state, you might you might hear them. Or like the mink frog is only found in the UP. So, um, so thank you so much, Kathy. Really appreciate that. Yes. And you know, this is this is uh, free. Somebody's saying maybe AI in the future will help us identify them. Well. <laughs> Meanwhile, you got to learn these. So. <laughs> right. And I enjoy working with the Friends of the Rouge. I think that's, you know that. So thank you. Well, thank you so much. It's been uh, such a, a great relationship with you. And we really appreciate you doing this. So uh, I am going to um, go back to my slides and just cover a few things and then let you all go. Uh, if you want to stick around, if you have a few more questions, we're happy to do that. Uh, so let me just do a screen share here. Here we go. Um, let me pull this into slideshow. Um, so just a few things. Uh, we kept mentioning James Harding. This is the Michigan Frogs, Toads, and Salamanders book. Um, if you want to learn more about Frogs and Toads of Michigan, um, I'd highly recommend this, this book about Michigan-specific frogs and toads. Um, we used to actually get copies of it and sell it when we had our workshops in person, but it actually ended up that it's cheaper for you to, to get it online for the, than for us to try to do that. So uh, great, great resource, pocketbook, um, if you want to learn more about them. Um, so the survey. So uh, a lot of you on this call already do the survey. Thank you for coming again today to review. Um, uh, Sam is telling me there's a button. I don't know how to get rid of that. Oops. Um, uh, anyway, um, thank you for coming today to review. Uh, if this is your first time and you want to sign up for the survey, uh, we would like you to attend the next session, which goes into the specifics. I'm not going to go to the specifics of the survey today. This is just the introductory session. Um, but to do the survey, uh, we just request that you be available several times a month from March through July. 
um, and you go out and you listen after dark. We don't tell you the exact time to go. We just will give you the correct conditions. So it needs to be over 46, 46 degrees or warmer, not windy. If it's damp, it's great, not a thunderstorm. Um, and then you determine when you're going to go out. You do these on your own. Um, and you might start these in March, depending on the year. It might be more like April. Um, this is the form that we use. So uh, you will fill out the top of it when you um, first get your survey block, just some information about your block and the, the type of habitat. Um, and then each time you go out, you will put in the date, your start time, some information about the wind and the air temperature and whether it's raining, and then just check off what species you hear. Uh, we now have an online data entry, we'll call it an app too, it's similar to Kathy's app and then it's available online. And this will enable you to find your block. Um, we assign quarter square mile blocks and confirm that that is the block that you were assigned. And then you will be able to put in your name and put in your observations. Um, and uh, this survey is um, based on giving people a quarter of a square mile section. So it's based on township range section, quarter section, if you're familiar with that. But basically, a quarter square mile will give you the whole block, ask you to find all the wetlands out there and figure out how you can access them and then listen in as many different types of wetlands as you can. So some people just have one good listening point because they just have one good wetland in their area. Some people travel around, walk around, or drive around depending where they are. Um, and we, the maps uh, that we give you have aerial photos with kind of a dotted line around your area um, that you're responsible for. And then we have a wetlands layer uh, there that kind of gives you an idea of the wetlands. Um, sometimes the wetlands are gone, sometimes there's wetlands that are not there, um, but this is our, our best to give you that. Now, um, if you hear frogs outside of your area, uh, you're not going to report them for this area, but we might then say, okay, do you want to survey the block next door if you're hearing a lot of stuff there? Um, so uh, that is it to this workshop. Um, I think uh, Sam has put it in the chat or you will get an email from us with a link to sign up for the workshop on the 25th. I know there was a question in chat about uh, this training. We will, we will place a recording of it up online. We will also do that with the February 25th one um, so that you can review it. Um, and I'm going to stop sharing and um, we, uh, we are all uh, through right now, so uh, if anybody wants to stick around and has a few questions, um, other than that, um, thank you so much for participating today. Thank you for being here. Thank you for caring about our frogs and toads, and uh, I really uh, hope that you sign up for the survey, and I hope that you hear lots and lots of frogs and toads.